allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Malcolm Adekandi. Can you dig it? All right, well, good morning again, everybody. My name is uh, Nicole Kirksey, and I am a member here at Cross Point Church. Um, I don't know many of you. I'm pretty new here still, but uh, I've been around. I'm here. I work on the teaching team, which is the group of people who put, work together to put the Sunday messages together. I'm honored to serve there. I'm also honored to serve as a member of our church council. Now, many of you who ever touched base at the South Hanover campus at the Perking Point will definitely know me. I am a frequent visitor. I live right across the street from the Perking Point. They know me by my sandwich and my coffee there. I'm there all the time. Love it. If you haven't been there, please go there. It's a great place. But I am on loan to you this morning from my home campus, which is the Rutherford campus. Pastor Dave is with Pastor Chris there at the Rutherford campus, and so I'm here with you this morning. So thank you very much for having me. So last week we started our At The Movies series, and we started it off with a bang with the blockbuster Jurassic World, and we talked about uh, the scripture from Genesis uh, chapters 1 and 2, the creation story, and how we as God's very good creation are expected to be diligent and responsible as we reign, R-E-I-G-N, over the earth. And so that was an awesome message. But this week, we're not going to do a blockbuster movie. We're uh, using a movie that opened to critical acclaim. It's much more a moviegoer's movie. And that movie, as you have seen, is called Dope. And since it's not a blockbuster, I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. Um, dope, the flavor of Dope is sort of part Spike Lee and part John Hughes. So if you are a movie buff, you know who those two folks are. They are triple threats. They are writers, producers, and directors. Spike Lee's movies are much more in the urban genre. He talks about African-American experience, poverty, political stuff. And Spike Lee also does comedy very well. And then John Hughes, you got to know him. He does comedy very well. He did the Vacation series. And he's also known for 80s teen genre movies. Uh, one of his movies is 16 Candles, and that's one of Pastor Jen's favorite movies. So if you ever go over to Perking Point, mention that to her. That'll make her smile. So if you put all of that together, you've got urban experience, you've got poverty, you've got political stuff, you've got comedy and more comedy, a little bit of action and a teen flick blended together, and that's the flavor of dope. And what we learn from our passage of scripture today and from the movie Dope is that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And one of the ways that he sends us strength is through sending us help, a little help from our friends. So as I was preparing today, you can imagine a song kept going through my head as I was as working on it, and it's a song called With a Little Help for My Friends. Now, I'm not a Beatles fan. They were a little bit before my time, just a tiny bit. Um, but the song kept going through my head, so I thought, let me dig into it and, and figure out what I'm remembering back here that I may not be conscious of. So that particular song was written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. John Lennon is the founder of the Beatles, and Paul McCartney, of course, was his first recruit. They co-led um, this famous, world-famous group together. And this was one of the last songs that Lennon and McCartney sat down and wrote together. They, too, were a prolific team. They wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs, mostly for the Beatles, but also very successful songs as well. One of their songs is the most recorded ever in history, so that's amazing. But they sat down to write this song, and it, it was a friendship story. So John Lennon tells the story of when they were sitting down to write this song. They were writing the song for their friend Ringo, who's also in the band. Ringo didn't usually sing lead, but they were writing the song for Ringo. And John says they were doing all the things they weren't supposed to do. They were goofing around. So this was a pop song, with a little help from my friends. I won't have us sing it. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a pop ditty, and John says they weren't doing pop. They're like playing rock and roll and reading magazines and telling jokes and throwing all kinds of lyrics together that make no sense, and up pops this song about friendship. And it talks about friends being with one another during the ups and downs of life. So you guys may remember the lyrics. The first lyric is, what would you say if I sang out of tune? I will not be singing out of tune or otherwise today. <laughs> um, that you can hear me. But um, they said, what would you do when I sang out of tune? I imagine my friends being at karaoke with me and me picking a bad song and it not going well at all. Um, it says, will you walk out on me? Of course not. We're friends. We're going to stick together. It asks if, if I'm 
feeling melancholy. My heart is broken because my loved one's away. Are you just going to leave their, me there crying by myself? No, you're going to come and hang out with me and encourage me. It talks about getting by with a little help from our friends. And so when I looked into that song, I realized that it was reminding me of a passage of scripture from Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. And the first part of that scripture says, a friend loves at all times. So that's what the Beatles are singing about, right? The ups and downs of life, uh, whether you're being an embarrassment or you're being a bummer, I still love you and I'm gonna stick with you. But the rest of that passage talks about what we're talking about today, what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Philippians 4. It says, a brother is born for adversity. So a brother is not an everyday friend. A brother is someone who is knit in the spirit to you. A brother is somebody who is born, literally created. When we think about people who are born, we're all created by God. So a brother or a sister is created by God for adversity. And we know from the book of James that adversity is coming. It's not a matter of if, it's when diverse trials come. How many people have had troubles in their lives? Diverse trials come to your life. Are you all easy living folk at 9.30? I need to come over here more often. <laughs> I myself have had many diverse trials, and I have brothers and sisters who are born for adversity. Um, so that's a blessing. So when I was thinking about that and reminded of that scripture, I saw examples of that in the movie Dope and in the passage of scripture from Philippians today. So let me talk a little bit more about um, the movie Dope and explain how the, the connection is. So you saw in the trailer, um, Dope is set in South Central Los Angeles. If you're not familiar with South Central Los Angeles, um, it's urban, it's high need, it's high crime, it's called the ghetto, South Central Los Angeles, he's in Inglewood. And he and his friends are the honor students, they're the nerds of their high school. And Malcolm's got one goal in life, and that is to apply to and get into Harvard. This is all he's living for. Now, how many people have applied to an Ivy League school? Okay, so y'all know the suffering, amen. This is not about filling out an application and sending it in, oh no. You have to get an interview with an alumnus first, that is part of your application. The essay is all important. Students work on that for years sometimes. It's very intense. And you better get it in on time because know that Harvard is not entertaining late applications. That's not happening. So he is all about it, all about Harvard, all about getting in, et cetera. Then this event happens that we see at the trailer, something totally out of his control. And the next thing you know, Malcolm is saddled with a bag of drugs, the dope in his life. So now Malcolm has to deal with two essential things, getting into Harvard, all important, and this bag of dope, not his problem, not his fault, but if he doesn't get rid of it, he is in danger, he might lose his life or his freedom. And we run into the Apostle Paul in chapter four, verse 10, he's in a similar situation. The Apostle Paul too is about his life purpose. He's the Apostle Paul, right? If you know anything about Paul's story, he was doing one thing and God had a little talk with him, so now he's doing something else. And he has this huge life purpose. He's supposed to advance the gospel throughout the whole earth, and he's supposed to encourage believers everywhere. But what's going on with Paul? He's in jail. And Paul didn't do anything wrong or anything illegal. This was not a circumstance that Paul was unfamiliar with either. But he was in jail. So how can you do these two important and essential things? Advance the gospel and encourage believers and do what God has called you to do and what you're passionate about. And on one hand, and get rid of being in jail or manage being in jail at the same time on the other hand, right? And we know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, of course, and one of the ways that God strengthens us is that he sends us some help from our friends. Amen. Amen. My husband helping me out, thank you. <laughs> so let's go to the um, scripture. Paul says in verse 10, he praises God that his friends are concerned about him. And it just hit me reading that, starting out with that passage. He didn't say, thank you for being concerned about me. He says, I praise God that you are concerned about me. He understands that when our friends consider us and care for us and are with us through the ups and downs, really all glory goes to God. God is the ultimate provider who strengthens and who helps us. So even when our friends help us, we have to remember that God provided the friends and whatever help that they bring. 
So whether they're bringing money we can borrow, a place to stay, a shoulder to cry on, wisdom, whatever it is, God provided the friend and the resources as well. And then Paul goes on to talk about verses 11 through 12. He says something very meaningful to the Philippians, and I want to read it again. It says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's a, with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little. So Paul is describing here a condition that the Philippians are very familiar with. Now, the Philippians were not a prosperous church. The Philippians were poor overwhelmingly. Many of them were even slaves. And the Philippians were living under religious oppression as a minority. The area where they were in Philippi was not a place where Christians abounded or, or Judea, Judaism reigned. Oh no, it was around much more secular philosophy. And one of the philosophies that reigned was Stoicism. And Stoicism, Stoicism teaches us about self-dependence, self-reliance. And so Stoicism, the message is sort of, I don't have need of anything, because whatever I need, I have it in myself. I'm not attached to people. I don't need anything from anybody. I'm not looking for anybody to give me anything. I'm not attached to the outcome. I'm not looking for resources. I'm good, whatever I have, whatever I need. I can take care of this, is Stoicism. And so when Paul is talking about having a little or having a lot, and I don't have any need, and I'm good, they understand that. But then in the second part, he's talking about a secret. A secret, one that he shared with them already, but that he's reinforcing now which is, I'm not embracing this philosophy that you've heard before. The secret is that I'm content because I am fully dependent and reliant on God. True contentment comes from dependence on and trust in God. That's what contentment comes from. Pastor Dave was talking this morning when he preached at 8 o'clock about how in our society, that's what we struggle with, being content. In our own heads, we never have enough. We always want more. We, nothing is ever sufficient. But when we truly rely on and trust in God, we really can and do have peace. But it's a practice, something that we must continue in. And Paul is setting that standard for us um, in the passage of Scripture at that time. The other thing that it teaches us is that contentment also means trusting God's way. Now, that would be my area. God is God, right? He does things in his own way, in his own timing. And sometimes we don't want to hear anything about that. We want God to do things our way. We want him to hurry up. We want him to send him just like this. This is who we want to send. This is what we want to do so we can say hallelujah. And when he doesn't do it like that, our lips are twisted, as my mom would say. You know, so, um, but we can be content and trust God about how he's going to come through for us because when he comes through, it's going to be awesome. There's a, amen, there's a passage of scripture. Psalm chapter 20, verses 1 through 2. This is the most, to me, one of the most incredible and powerful passages of Scripture. It's a prayer. And the Psalms, you have to remember, were written before the time of Christ. So people's perceptions of God are a little different than ours are now. And so the perception then was the sanctuary was not a place like this where people just gathered. The sanctuary was a place where God dwelled, where he lived, where he ruled and reigned. There's that word from last week, R-E-I-G-N, where he reigned. Where if you needed something from God, you needed to go to the sanctuary, you needed to give an offering that was acceptable, and that God would accept your offering, and then you would give a petition that was acceptable, and that God would send you help from where he lives. God himself the emperor and the creator of the universe would send you and me help from where he is, out of who he is. So this person is praying. It says, in times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. Now we can't Take this lightly because the help that God sends is from his sanctuary. And when he sends you help from a sanctuary from where he rules and reigns, I want you just to imagine what it is. Do you think that it'll be sufficient to supply all your needs? Just consider that. You don't have to answer me. 
Now, I can send you help from where I am. You need five dollars to hold, as we would say. <laughs> I can send you help from where I am. But when you have a real deep need, a spiritual need, an emotional need, an emergent financial need, a health need, your baby's in trouble, your marriage is in trouble, your job is on the line, your safety is in trouble. Do you want help from somebody or do you want help from the sanctuary? The prayer says God sends you help from the sanctuary and sometimes that help from the sanctuary has on the form of a friend. The brothers and sisters born for adversity, those who love at all times. We can't look each other in the eye the same way we always have. I look at you all like help from potential help from the sanctuary and that I could be potential help from you. That's what congregations are supposed to be to each other. We're supposed to do life together. So we're supposed to be happy with each other. When I asked you earlier to fill out that prayer request card and that praise report, it wasn't an exercise in futility. Yeah, fill out the form. People really pray over there as prayer requests, and we really do praise God with you when he has come through. That's something that is really, really essential and important part of our faith. It really makes every bit of the difference for each of us, not only for the person who's the central person in the story, if you will, but also for those of us who are the help from the sanctuary. Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends help us carry the burden, and we just might be the help that God sends. So back to the movie, Dope, there was this situation where Malcolm is, remember he's trying to apply for Harvard, it never stops, and then he's got this dope, got to get rid of it. And at one point, you know, in the movie, the suspenseful part, it's like, oh my goodness, this is never going to get resolved. So he looks at this bag of dope that he has, I don't happen to have a bag around, but he has this, looks at the bag and he physically picks it up and he says, this is my weight to carry. And I imagine that his nerdy friends, if they knew about these passages of scripture and about the story about the Beatles, because Malcolm's friends were in a band as well, I forgot to mention that, they're in a punk band. Can you imagine a punk band in the middle of South Central? They are sticking out like sore thumbs, they really are. God bless them. But I imagine that their friends would say something, his friends would say something like this. Dude, we are the Beatles. We are John and Paul, and people are going to be talking about us even when we're dead, because we are just that cool. And we can't get there. We can't get to our life goals. We can't get to Harvard and everywhere else if we leave you here. Now, when it was a party, and we were going to somebody's party, we were there. When you met a girl and you were all, you know, in the head about that, we were there for that. Now that the time is troublesome, we're here for that too. And we're not going anywhere. We love you at all times, even when you have blown it, and even when you might get us all in trouble. We are here still. And they literally said to him, it's our weight to carry as well. So friends are there, and they do help us in true times of adversity, and they help us to carry the burdens that we need to carry. Um, I'm going to take one little break here. I did apologize to the media people and told them that I could be sharing at any given time and miss a teaching note. So if I missed a teaching note, I apologize. <laughs> but we could talk about it. I'll keep talking, and I'm sure that I'll run into it. So, for your consideration today, I won't spoil anything for you if I tell you that everything worked out for Malcolm in the end, right? He was able to apply for Harvard. He was able to complete his application. He was able to turn in his interview. We saw a little bit in the trailer about how he argued uh, with his guidance counselor about what was gonna be in his essay. He did it his way and he did it well. And so it worked out. The dope that he had to get rid of was gone. He was not in prison. He was not hurt. And I promise you, I'm not spoiling anything for you if I tell you that, because it is a movie, right? And you knew that. I'll also tell you for the Apostle Paul that things continue to work out for him as well. If we look at the end of the passage of our scripture from Philippians chapter 4, I want to read verses 18 through 20 again. It says, At the moment I have, every, I have all that I need and more. I am, a generously, I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with, from, with Epaphroditus. 
At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Verse 19 says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Paul, remember part of his ministry is to encourage believers. What Paul knew is that the same way that he was in trouble at the time, other believers would be in trouble as well. We're not always the central character. We're not always Malcolm. Sometimes we're the nerdy friends, the ones who stick with you and love you at all times. Sometimes we're the ones who come through in times of adversity. We're not always the Apostle Paul. Sometimes we're the Philippians, and we can't turn to God and say, well, God, I, I can't help this person or that person because I don't have anything. These people were poor. They were slaves. And yet Paul says in the middle passages of the scripture, you guys helped me when no other church would. Other churches had means, but the Philippians sent help more than once when he was in another city. There was no UPS and US mail and any of that. He had to send that by people. They had to gather up what they had. They had to take the time to do it and gather it and take it to him over and over and over again. These people who were bound themselves, they made that sacrifice. And this person, Epaphroditus, I learned from study, he got sick when he went to give Paul his gift. Can you imagine? He left his wife. He may have left his job. He may be traveling on someone else's provision. He makes this long trip and he gets there and he gets sick. Ugh. He's making that sacrifice. Sometimes we're Epaphroditus. We're not always John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Sometimes we're Ringo Starr. We need somebody to write a song for us. <laughs> we need somebody to stick with us when we sing out of tune. You know, Ringo said, I'm not singing that. I'm not singing that line, but he did. <laughs> Sometimes we're in Go Star. We're not always the center. And so sometimes we have to be ready to be those men and women of God that God sends from the sanctuary. So we have to do all things. We have to, to fulfill the call of God on our lives and do the things we're passionate and happy and enthusiastic about on the one hand. We have to deal with the trials and troubles and tribulations of life on the other hand, the things that come against us. And the, my favorite are the ones that are not my fault. I'm like, God, this is not my problem. How did I get it? And yet it has to be dealt with. And then on top of that, we have to turn around and be helped to someone else. How can we do all that? Well, the scripture tells us that. And this, these are the action steps. Pastor Dave gave everybody an assignment this morning at 8 o'clock. I guess I'm going to give an assignment too. He wants to, everybody to email him and let him know you did a couple things by Tuesday. So the first thing we can do is praise God. So the one thing that, that Paul did all through the passages of Scripture, he put God first and gave God all the praise. When we're going through something, we can praise God knowing that he is going to send us help from the sanctuary knowing that he's going to send us a little help from our friends, knowing that in his way and his timing, he is going to provide for us, and we can praise him in advance. So we can praise God, and we can make sure that when it is re resolved, we give him all the glory, and we don't take credit for what God has done. The other thing is that we can be content. We can remember to take a look at ourselves and look at our track record with God. Are we breathing? Do we have a place to live? Did we eat recently? Do we have a measure of health? Look at all of the good and great things that have happened in our lives. We have so much to be more than content about, happy and downright enthusiastic about we have in our lives that will cause us to praise God. We used to say in the old church, God, if you never do another thing for me, if you never do another thing for me, I want to thank you for all that you've done. If we can get to that true place, we can be truly content. And that will help us to do all of these things that we have to accomplish. And then the third thing that we see from the last passage of scripture is that we can offer help. We can offer help to someone else. So Pastor Dave encouraged us all 
to really prayerfully consider, because remember, as great as I think I am sometimes, I'm not everybody's help, right? I don't have everything everybody needs, right? So I have to pray and say, God, I'm available for you to use, you to use however you choose. Who can I reach out to? Who needs a call from me? Who needs an email or a text from me? Who do I need to do a drive-by, a good drive-by, where I stop by their house or their work? Not that other kind of drive-by. On and encourage them, because we all need encouragement, amen. So think about somebody between now and Tuesday that you might need to reach out to and do so. When you like it, if you were, because you never know what somebody's going through. God does, though. And how many times have you gotten that call or that email right at the right time and just say, I was thinking about you. I miss you. What's going on with you? And you're like, wow, God, thank you. Thank you that someone considered me. So let's be that to someone else. The other thing that Pastor uh, Dave did was to ask everybody, look around, look around. Physically, go ahead, look around. There's some missing space around here. So that means that there are some people who are usually here who are not here. Now we know it's summertime and people are vacationing and people may be serving in other places and so forth, but sometimes people are missing. I can't tell you when the last time was that I went to the Rutherford campus. Now I'm not AWOL, I report in. I said, I was over here. I was at that, oh, that South Hanover. They got me with that sandwich, I'm sorry. <laughs> sometimes it happens, but there are people who you may not have seen or talked to in a while and just reach out to them and not in a punitive way like, where were you? But say, hey, I missed you. I was thinking about you. How are you doing? And wait for a response and see if you get some interaction and, and let people know again that you're considering them because everybody needs some help and some feedback. So like Malcolm's friends and Dope and like the Philippians for Paul, we can move out of our own comfort zones and offer some real help. Remember, it's not about how great we are and all we have, it's about our great God and who he is, right? So we can offer some help, even when we think our own supply is not sufficient. Because in Christ, we are always sufficient. In Christ, we're always sufficient, and we have everything we need. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's pray. Father God, I just thank you. I just thank you for your magnificent word today through song and ministry. Lord, I just thank you for the people of God who have gathered in your name. I thank you for creating an environment where we can freely gather to worship you. We can speak your word, Lord, with boldness, that we're not under oppression, Father God, but you have given us great liberty. Help us to be responsible with that privilege, Father God. And help us to remember, Father God, that you have made us interdependent on each other to be fully dependent on you. Help us to look to you for ways in which we can be sufficient. We, we, can, be, we can help supply needs, Father God. Needs for connection. Needs for sharing. Needs for acknowledgement. To let somebody know that we see them. We're so busy in life, Father God. Sometimes we just go through and we don't even see each other. We don't connect and we don't stop. Father God, help us to be better in that way and reflect more of your great and loving spirit. Let the praise reports come rolling in. Let them email Pastor Dave. Let him be cranky about his email being full because there's so many praises coming through because your spirit is moving as you connect people with one another, Father God. And we'll just be mindful always to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen.